Internet, welcome back to another episode of the Premium Pete Show. Finally, <coughs> finally, <laughs> damn that uh, that that is it Moet? It's Moet. Oh Moet. Well, I what's the pronounced name? Of it, the, 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 the 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 correct pronunciation. The proper way to pronounce Mo, Moet is Moet. Okay. French people pr- pronounce it that way. It's French, though. So. Okay. Well, listen, Internet. For a long time, um, I've been trying to get uh, the one and only Vasti on. Um, you could call her many things. I tell you, there's so many goddamn titles that people could call you. But I'm probably one of the biggest things is uh, people probably say, "What? What? What does she do? What, what, you ever get people?" Uh, ask my you mom that? included. My mom asked me if I did catering for a living. Really? Yeah. Why would she think catering? I don't. I don't my little Trini mom. Uh, she doesn't understand anything that I do, even the film stuff. So she just thinks, "Oh, you do events? That's like catering." I'm like, mom, like, hello. Do you you talk to me? Like, you should know this by now. But um, so yeah. Even after all this time. Yeah. Okay. Hey, this is a different intro, but uh, Internet's the one and only uh, downtown sweetheart. Is she still? Are you still consider downtown sweetheart? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uptown, she'll be there uh, probably in the the, the next decade. <laughs> The one and only Vashti. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you for having me. Listen, um, I was listening to our show that we did, which you called The Therapy. uh, It was. With uh, the late, great Combat Jack. Um, And I was like, damn, man, you know, it's funny, too, because a lot of the things that you were saying of doing, you're still doing or even doing more. I remember you were mentioned the first when you opened up saying that you were with macadamia or whatever. Oh, remember that? Do the you remember hair that? product thing? Yeah, yeah, and I was like, what is, I thought it was nuts, and you're like, it is, but it's like some some product you were messing with at the oh, time. Oh, okay, I had I was doing a campaign yeah. for a hair company, so yeah. Listen, for people listening who know of Vashti, uh, what they're going to do is learn a little bit more. People who don't know of you, I want them to learn about you. You grew up in Albany, right? I did. Crazy. We're gonna get you know, the reason why I say it's crazy. <laughs> Do you because, want me to expand on that now or later? No, no. I mean, the reason why I say it's crazy is because if you think about it, and we'll get back to it, but a girl from Albany who takes a, a, a whim, moves to the city, now is on her, a, a multiple passports, traveled the world, um, has had her finger, you know, uh, and you know, on many, many things involved in the culture. Um, even, I mean, so many things. It's just, you got to, sometimes people, you know, look, I have a lot of people on here that have done a lot of things. Sometimes people don't even realize, uh, they, they know what they're doing, but they don't realize of how far they came, you know? Because I remember you saying that, you know, you know, Albany, you missed it, right? But, you know, you didn't know what you wanted to do, you know? And, and then having, like, you know, growing up and, and, you know, did you, put it this way, before we even get to where you were born, did you, did you think that you would be where you are today? I didn't have an idea of where I would be or what I would be doing, but I knew that where I was was not it. And I knew I wanted to leave it. So that's what I was definitely sure of. I think that being a young kid, I was really good at art in general. And I mean, I was winning awards and my artwork was in like the newspaper, the local newspaper. So for me, I was like, I want to be an artist. I want to be in New York. That's all I knew. But I didn't envision anything like this. Sure. When people say they want to be an artist, right? But you know, they may know what they want. They want to be in that field, but they don't know exactly say what they want to do. Right. But, you know, the reason why I even say that for is somebody like you. You know, I, I resemble myself to understanding this. I remember when you were even mentioning, uh, and this is later on in life, where Def Jam asks you to work. You know, at Def Jam, which is funny because some, most of the times people would ask to work at Def Jam. Right. And I remember you saying that you were a little confused on how, like, they're, they're like, well, you know, you got somebody, you know what's going on, and you know it's cool, and, you know, you know some info, and ba- basically we're bringing you on to for you to tell them what was going on or give them some insight or whatever. And that's what we, the world, like, think about it, that's the world we live in today, meaning, like, you know, and I remember you saying, like, like I didn't think I'd get paid for that. Like, right, yeah. But that's valuable information. Absolutely. Your, 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 uh, your contacts, your relationships, your knowledge, your history, just, j- j- just your respect level. You know, you, you, so, so it's funny how, like, you know, you think of something like that. But let's get back. You grew up in Albany. Yes. Uh, what was that like? Um, so Albany, I grew up in downtown Albany, so it, it resembled a city. It wasn't, you know, country. It wasn't suburban. Um, and I grew up in the hood, which is always laughable. I mean, because I say it all the time. Only because I think that people who see me now, they don't know. They just think, oh, you're from, like, a nice suburban sure. area. They your think parents you're fancy. Were, yeah, and I'm like, no, girl. Mm-hmm. Um, so, <laughs> so I, you know, it's important for me to, to kind of, from time to time, express that. But grew up in the hood. Um, 
in a predominantly black neighborhood, but also it was a West Indian community. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of Jamaican families. So I never felt like, uh, I always felt like I knew, you know, where I was from as far as my culture and heritage. And then, you know, but growing up poor, I was like, okay, this is not what I want. Like, I want to do more. I want to expand. Um, both of my parents are from Trinidad, you know, came to America for a better way of life. And sure. so, uh, you know, very thankful for everything that they did. But, you know, it was definitely like always interested in the world outside of what I knew like I loved hip-hop I loved like I loved growing up in the hood but I was like you know what's it like out there like what's going on like what's music like what's fashion like so um and at the time you know MTV was a big part of my like world view you know magazines for sure Sure. you know remember what magazines um I mean I well at that time I was watch or looking at a lot of uh skate magazines so like Thrasher Thrasher, um Big Brother um and so those were kind of like I was into skate culture so that was something that kind of pulled me into it but then um definitely I feel like I don't know if I know Honey was out Honey Mm -hmm. was like a huge like amazing like representation for me of women of color who weren't just like one way, like portrayed, you know, maybe by other standards at that time, maybe like like the woman, the women in essence, or, you know, it was just sort of like, there was essence, which was women of color, but it was like definitely a different kind of woman than me. But, you know, the other option at that time was like Vogue or, you know, Mademoiselle. I feel like I don't remember all the magazines, but Honey was a huge portion of like representation for me because it was like all kinds of women of color with like varying styles um so those helped but definitely mtv because there was yo mtv raps there was um fade to black there was so many shows that showed life outside of albany so that really inspired me do you remember the first uh song you ever listened to that that got you and it doesn't have to be hip-hop you know do you remember what it was um that made you really love music where you're like you know what i mean I feel like, yes, I feel like at the time it has to be between Biggie, Ready to Die was like a huge, sure. huge like album for me, but also Bjork. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if those kind of give you the visual of the varying worlds I was interested in and Tricky, mm-hmm. Tricky being the British like hip hop artist, uh, not the producer, mm-hmm. but yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or not Run DMC. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, so mom, what did mom do? My mom worked at a nursing home. Okay. So she uh, was just a nurse at a nursing home. My dad uh, was a car mechanic. Um, and both of them... Is that is that still around? Yeah. Okay. Do you have a relationship with them? Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah. Because I remember, um, and you'll speak to it, but I remember you uh, speaking about growing up in the household, um, how, you know, dad, you know... Uh, the relationship there with mom wasn't the best, you mm-hmm. know, where he would, uh, you know, there'd be a lot of arguments, a lot of screaming. One of the most amazing things that hit me as a as as, as a person is I remember when you were talking about before uh, how people used to, growing up, they used to be like, fuck the police. And you were like, nah, I like when the police come <laughs> because, you know, pops, right. um, you know, uh, Talk through that if uh, what you, what you I, grew I, up I, the, Well, the, what I we had talked about on the previous um, show that I was on um, was that growing up having, um, you know, growing up in domestic abuse and sort of witnessing it and then being a victim to it, um, having the police come to your home was sort of like a savior. It was like, wow, thank you, because, you know, there was nothing that was going to stop my father from doing what he wanted to do, you know. So to me, I know that, you know, there is a sentiment that is very much fuck the police and and I'm not disagreeing with that and I'm just saying that there is that other duality of like you know growing up the police was were you know sure in that situation yeah sure. exactly for in sure. that situation but um but yeah so I grew up in that sort of world so yeah so so when when that all happened like you know when pops are obviously growing up in pops and dealing with you know domestic violence like that with mom and stuff like that um and you know people in the household when he left, did you, you know, I, I know that was tragic for you, but I mean, did, 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 did you miss him at all? Were you able to speak to him after that? Were you able to connect with him and hang out with him? Or did he come by for weekends, you know? No, he didn't come back at all. Um, he was, um, he was arrested. And uh, so that was like sort of like the last time I had seen him and at 14. And uh, he, you know, came back to talk to me and then we sort of had a relationship kind of, but... 
for the most part, I was happy. Like I, I then went on to high school, um, you know, out in the suburbs. I got a scholarship to a really nice high school. And then I started meeting, you know, other fellow students, like girls who were like, oh, my parents are divorced and it's such a heartbreaking experience. And I couldn't identify. I was like, oh, my God, thank God my dad is gone. You know, like there's so much drama that's alleviated. But um, so for me, I was totally fine with it. True. Yeah. Did he ever did he ever like have a talk with you or apologize to you or anything like that or any like any type of, you know, feeling like, yo, if I ever made the reason why I say that for is just being a father. Mm -hmm. If I ever you know, I can never see myself, but if I ever happen to be in a situation like that or I ever was the 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 guilt or the remorse or you know, feeling, you know, like to go back and you know, just speak to like, yo, to your daughter or like, you know, I I'm just saying that's something that would sit with me, you know? Yeah, I think that that takes a different personality. I mean, I don't think you'd ever be in that particular position to have done what my father did. I think it's just two different people and two different personalities. Um, you know, there's a lot I've learned over the years, and I think that for me, um, I mean, to answer your question, sorry, my father has never really apologized. Like, he has, but I don't think he understands. Sure. And it's not that he's... And not to say that I wouldn't accept an apology. Uh, I just feel like he doesn't take responsibility for much of what has happened to me and my siblings. And um, and I feel like that also, to me, in my mature self, speaks to the fact that he's not maybe capable of that. You know, not sure. everyone's capable. And um, and but I know, looking back at it, like I don't feel. I don't feel like a victim anymore. And I know that maybe, oh, that's like a cute way of putting it. But it's like, I really don't. Like, I feel like, okay, if I hadn't experienced this, I probably wouldn't be sitting here with you right now. Sure, sure. Like, maybe I would have had like, like, I never was like daddy's girl. I wasn't like spoiled or anything. So I don't know what that life would have been like for me. I, maybe I'd be like perfectly fine living in Albany and being, you know, like someone's wife or something. I don't know. But for me, it made me more want to like get out of that situation. So I think that that sort of helped inspire my actions post, but um but I you know, I think that that I think that maybe we're born into situations that either propel us or don't propel us. Like we we have to make that choice of can how can I make this work for me? How can I get inspired by this to get out of this, you know? Sure. You know, I remember, uh, you know, you th you think back, you know, somebody who's going through that type of situation, you know, did you and mom ever have a, a talk like kind of like where she just broke down to you what was going on or even though I know you probably knew, but you're only yeah. 14 years old. No. Right? So, no, my parents never spoke to me on an emotional level or like a very communicative level. And I don't know if that speaks. I think that speaks to the culture gap, the age gap. Um and the education gap. My parents both didn't really attend school. My mom was like, I think the oldest of 13 children. So as soon as she was like old enough, like 10 years old to take care of other kids, she was doing that. She wasn't really going to school. Um, and not to say that if people don't go to school, they don't have the communication sure. skills. But in this instance, it was very much, um, there was a barrier. So there was no conversation. It was like, this is just trying to figure it out as it goes. Sure. Um, but I think on the other hand, and this is, you know, having been a child of domestic abuse and noticing that, you know, for an abuser, there usually needs to be a victim and someone who plays into that role. And not to say that every person in a position that is a victim chooses to be a victim, but sometimes there is a sort of like relationship that happens between, you know, there's the abuser, but there's the victim and they attract each other. And then there's usually like the hero that has to come in and, you know, it's like a weird ongoing cycle. So, um, you know, those are things that I've paid attention to and I kind of see that happen often outside of that too, so. Sure. You know, throughout your career, you know, you obviously traveled the world and we'll get into that. Um, were you, um, did you ever focus on like um, domestic abuse and like going to like schools or centers or did you ever speak at any or try to like uh, No, something? but I should. I feel like for me, the, the more, um, the area that I would probably focus on with that would be with children because I think that they're sort of, the true victim of it all because sure. they're trapped in it. And not to say that, you know, you know, everyone does what they can, but you know, also as a child, you would expect your mother to do specific things to get out of that situation. If especially their children are victims of it. But uh, I think, you know, the true, true victims of this are, are the children. Sure. But, 
I should. It's inspiring. I should. You know, I think you should. I think you'd be great at it. You know, um, you think about uh, therapy is such like a cool thing now. Therapy is like wearing Jordans. You know, I love it. <laughs> not it is. It is becoming. Yeah. It's not become. You know, it's not becoming. There's so many things. Even look, rest in, again. Recipes are our, our brother Combat Jack. Yeah, rest when in I listen back, I was like, oh, there's so many things that you said. Like I remember you saying. Uh, uh, at that time, I guess two chains dropped the song. It's different, and you're like, yo, back in the day, people were like you oh, you want to get beat up yeah, if, you, yeah. if you were different. Now, so I, I bring that to the therapy way because do, do you do you go to therapy? Have you ever? I, I haven't been in a long time, but I for the past four years, five years, I was going consistently every week. Just just to talk about you know just to get things is what, what struck you to go. You know, for me, I think I'm constantly thinking about how I can evolve and how I I can grow. I mean. Whether that's through health, through the environment, like how can I recycle or compost? How can what can I do? So I feel like I'm constantly challenging myself. But you know, growing up in the the childhood that I had, I didn't want to repeat any of those same um, traits, or not necessarily violence or anger, but just sort of like you know being in a position where you're in a relationship that you that doesn't serve you so just wanting to like express myself um have a safe place where you know i could just talk to someone without it being you know because sometimes when you talk to a friend you can't so you know they, it's, it can be therapeutic but sometimes they're they're guiding you through how they would do sure. something and or they judge you exactly so and, and, and internet, listen, stop putting so much pressure on other fucking people. They got their own lives to worry about. I mean, we do have friends and we do have besties, as you call or some people say. Or, and But sometimes I realized, I was like, holy shit. I, I remember when I was getting divorced, uh, my cousin, man, God, I would call her all the fucking time. Yeah. And she just was a house phone. And uh, she was on. I'm like, fucking. And then one day I realized, I'm like, damn, I'm fucking bothering this person. Yeah, and you know, they have a life of yeah. their own, and I mean, obviously their intentions are good. They want it to yeah, like, yeah, be there for you, tell, but yeah. yeah. But then also sometimes you need to experience things on your own. You know, sometimes it is about figuring it out on your own. Like you can't just ask someone, "What do you think?" What it's like they're always going to go from their perspective, sure, and that's sure. only natural. It's just that's the life they led, and you know they're going to tell you what they think. But you know, but that's that. The other part of it is that if you're not willing or able or at a position to know this is what I need to do, then you're always going to be going off of someone else's advice. It's like you really need to take the time to be like, okay, how do I feel? Does this serve me? Does this make me happy? How do I feel about this? Because otherwise you're going to make a decision. That person could tell you don't ever talk to that other person again. And then you might do it really wanting to talk to that person again. And then you ultimately go back and talk. You know, it's like you have to know what when is enough for you. Sure. As being a woman in the industry and the culture and, and being involved in so many things where you worked in Def Jam, You've uh, you've been involved in the night scene, uh, club scene, you know, party scene, um, DJs, brands. Um, it, has it been? It, it, is it still tough out here? Meaning, uh, you know, do you still see the differences between men and women? Meaning, as far as pay, as far as like the way you're treated, do you see that still? Definitely. It, I mean, I think that that's something that. I I mean, it's it's. It's gotten better, but you definitely see it. But there's, it's interesting because I feel like I always say that, you know, like if I was a gay man or if I was a, tra you know, trans person, like there's always going to be something. So I don't tend to focus on it, you know, like I know that's putting rose color, colored glasses on, but I just don't think that focusing on it brings, you know, much change for yourself. Sure. And I think in that sense, I've not. I've not witnessed it or experienced it. Like I don't, I don't think I experience it in that way. And in fact, the interesting part of it, I had this conversation with a couple of DJ friends and one of my friends was like, you know, oh, being a girl DJ, like guys don't respect you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, but girl, we're getting hired for all of the like, the cute fashion events, like for the corporate stuff. Like, you know, it's interesting to see like, you know, fellow friends, like, male friends who DJed and like carried crates of records to clubs and, and not not saying that women didn't do that also but you know for the majority I think it was men and now it's like they're not being called on like they're they can scratch they can do anything and then it's just like oh they you know this is like this 17 year old girl who has a controller who doesn't really know music and she's getting hired so you know there are advantages somewhat but I'm not saying it's obviously the same as what the basics should be of equal pay and equal respect, but um, 
But it is lopsided in that sense yeah. in a lot of ways. Well, you've been able to carve out a lane for yourself too, as far as being like, uh, you know, have 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 like a, a fashion style to you always. I feel like appeal, and then like kind of like a streetwear, hmm. and then like. I don't, I don't want to say like a, a tomboy, but it's like people have said that like in the sense of like some of the outfits you pulled off were like kind of like you're one of the, one, one of the home, like, you know, like you're, like you're one of the homies. But then at the same time, it's like you, you're in some like fashion designer type thing. I don't know. You've been able like it's kind of weird. I think people can't really not saying all people, but I feel like some people like you switched it up a lot on people. Mm-hmm. You, they couldn't just put you in one pocket. You think that? Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I take that. Thank yeah. you. I, I don't think that I ever want to walk into an event and just be, you know, you always want to be yourself and you always want to be respectful of the dress code of whatever is going on. So I think for me, it's always important to like respect whatever space you're going into, but also do it in your own way. You know, like I wouldn't want to show up to a cocktail party and wearing just baggy jeans and a t-shirt and sneakers like I would probably wear a dress and you know sneakers or you know something that balances it that that really respects where I'm going but also my own style true so you leave Albany what age were you I was 18 years old why'd you leave because it was Albany. <laughs> no shade to upstate. Do you upstate. still go back to Albany? I mean, to visit family, but... Okay. Um, You're like, let's get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I mean, I love... Albany shaped me. I'm not For going sure. to disrespect that. And, you know, for me, go, growing up in the hood, but then going to a school in the suburbs with, you know, just wealthy white girls really, you know, had a part in my life, too. So, um, you know, I really... I love Albany, but it's not a place that I... Um, gravitating towards at this point you know like New York has been my home for so long um, when I was graduating high school I'd already known that I was going to move to New York I only applied to art schools in New York City so so that's sort of it, I was just set on New York since yeah. I was really young so and and you got accepted too I got accepted to a few schools, but ultimately went to the School of Visual Arts. Mm. You know, another thing is you hung around a lot of different tattoo shops growing up. Uh, I think you I got worked at a tattoo shop at, at, at Lark Street Tattoo. At what, like thirteen years old or something like that. Twelve years old. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. And mom and dad were, didn't say anything. They about weren't that? involved in my life. Really? They weren't. My mom worked usually double shifts. My dad came home pretty late, and so. It wasn't like, oh, what did you learn in school today? It was just dinner. It was like they didn't really talk to me. So, And, again, I don't want to dismiss my parents whatsoever because I love them and care about them, and I know they love and care about me. But it just wasn't the way that we communicated. We didn't function that way. Um, So it was easy for me to sort of explore worlds that were probably not the best place for me. But, you know, I was very curious and... um, and yeah, I don't know. But by the time my dad was gone, it was just my mom was literally working double shifts. She, I wouldn't see her until seven in, in the morning, and she worked from I want to say twelve p.m. until seven a.m. the next day. She worked from the twelve to like eleven p.m. shift, and then eleven p.m. to seven a.m. or something like that. So I would only see her for like one hour a day. What does she do now? Is she retired? She's retired. Yeah. Uh, now, throughout your success. Have you been able to like do something for her that she hasn't been able to do? Were you able to show? Because I know you said she still doesn't understand what you do, yeah. but a lot of people I've sat down where I'm like, you know, that's like a sign too, where they bought the mother a home, I bought them to send them on a trip, or you know what I mean, like did something <laughs> from. Have you have you done something where it's for mom? It's so where complicated like, in so many ways. I mean, I like buy my mother everything, and then the you thing. Bought her is, no, my mother wouldn't know what that is. <laughs> she wouldn't. And let me tell you what else. Everything I've ever bought my mother, she, I mean, if you know any West Indian person, they have barrels. Oh, they have barrels that they fill with yep. clothing and whatever and send it away. So every bag, every, my mother will, she'll never use it. She always sends it away. And I'm like, okay, so I can't get you anything really, really big or designer. And uh, so it's, it's a challenge, but um but in that way, I appreciate my mom, too, because she's not like, oh, buy me something or show me how how much you care about me through some sort of, you know, gift gift. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. So, you know, you know it, it, when you think about it, too, uh, 12, 13 years old working at a tattoo shop, um, you know, and we'll get to that. But but you also then later on, I remember, you know, knowing that you came to New York, worked in a tattoo shop. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh friend hung around supreme hung around what 
hanging around this many guys, especially, and not meaning only at the young age, but hanging around a lot of guys, do you feel that, like, because I think, like, I'll give an example. You know when guys always think that girls are hanging around, they think that guys are trying to mess with them? You know, have have you have you always had like where because you're like one of the fellas like I'm telling you your style you know I'm sure you heard that before when you, your style is always like oh she's like one of the one of, like hanging out with a with a homie did did you have a lot of problem where people always try to like you know holler at you or try to you know at, you know growing up no no what I didn't I, so in high school I was I hung out at this local park which a lot of dirtbag teenagers do you hang out at the local park you are there to skate bmx meet other kids buy or sell drugs i was there just because i skated so i would always hang out by the monument which is where everyone skated and became friends with these suburban white boys who were into what i liked i was like oh i love hip-hop and i love skating and bmxing it and at the time skating and bmxing was not something that like people of color at all respected or cared about and even me walking through my neighborhood with a skateboard it was like oh you trying to be white what's wrong with you like I Mm -hmm. would get harassed so I found solace in these other kids so with them it was like you know it was just we were just like they were disgusting and it was fine because I was I wasn't attracted to them and they weren't attracted to me it was like whatever so but you hung out with mostly guys yeah no yeah not a lot of girls no not a lot of girls, no. Is, is there a reason? Behind? Well, I was bullied in junior high what? by girls. Who did that? I'll go down and... I will tell you her name. I often, once a year, I like do you, my you my far? bully search. And I'm like, what are you doing? Oh, nothing. No, I'm uh, just <laughs> kidding. But um, but I do do bu- my bully search. Um, <laughs> and uh, why, why? Why were you bullied? You know, it's interesting. Okay, I will say, b- before... For a long time, someone, you know, I would say, oh, I was bullied because I was different. Like, I liked to skateboard. I didn't like to jump rope, which is what the girls would do during lunchtime. The guys would play, like, touch football or whatever else, like, play video games or something. But, like, for me, on Game Boy, but um, for me, I wasn't coordinated for jumping rope. So I was like, okay, I'm not really hanging with the girls. So I would hang out with the boys. It was just something that I was more. I don't know, I felt more natural doing. Also, growing up, I had an older brother and an older sister, and I was obsessed with my brother. Like, everything he played with, I wanted to play. Like, they I just, taught you a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. But with my sister, I wasn't that interested in what... I mean, I was inspired by her, but I wasn't that interested in the girl world. So, um, so I don't know if maybe the girls felt a kind of way about that and then bullied me. There was one girl who was... She came to our... She came to eighth grade as a new student and I'd known her over the summer as my other friend's friend. So I knew her and I was like, Oh cool. Like, let's be friends. Like I'll, you know, I'll totally show you around. And within one week, it's like out of a movie within one week, that girl became the most popular girl in class after being like, no one liked her. No one cared about her. And then all of a sudden she was like the coolest girl. And she was like, I'm going to ruin you. Like that was her whole role in my like eighth grade year. She just wanted to ruin me. And uh, a few years ago, I met someone in L.A. and we were working on a project or trying to. And he was asking me about my life. I think it was about doing a show about either inspired by my life or something. So he was asking me about my childhood. And I was like, oh, yeah, I was bullied. And he said to me, he's like, what do you think? Um, what do you think your role was in being bullied? And at the time, I was like, how dare you ask me that? But then at the same time, I was also like, maybe there was something I was doing. Maybe there, maybe there, not to say that I deserve to be bullied, but maybe I contributed to the situation. I don't know. You know, sometimes we do things and we don't realize we did it. Maybe this girl liked a boy that I didn't know she liked him and maybe she thought I was flirting with him. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know the answer, but since he asked me that now I tend to think like what did I contribute to this because sometimes we tend to think oh that person's an asshole or how dare they or I did nothing to do but it's like sometimes we have contributed and we don't realize it sure you know when you say you were bullied like what did they do uh Jump, getting jumped, um, death threats. Um, Damn, you're in Albany. You didn't put the razor in the mouth. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a lot of. <laughs> no. no money playing. Money playing. Box cutter. You didn't carry no, no box cutter. No, I went to Cal- we went to Catholic school and uh, outfit and everything. Yeah, uniform. Shit. I wore a uniform from kindergarten you post to, that up on to, to senior year. <laughs> 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 Uh, so again, you said you went to what? So jumped again. You went to senior what? No, I was saying I was. I wore a uniform from kindergarten to senior okay. year. 
That's crazy. Yeah. So you know you know why it's even crazy? And I give you a lot of credit because you learn how to stay fresh. You know, think about it. It's like almost like you're like a guy that that wears uh that wears a suit. Uh, you know, Monday nine to five, but he still got tons of sneakers, or he knows how to right. get fresh. So when his time comes, because you had an outfit for all this time, yeah, so it wasn't like you were picking these dope outfits out during the week. You had to get fresh when it was your time, right? You know? Um, it, it, listen, I went to Catholic school too, you know, where I wore a uniform, but only to third grade. Then they kicked me. They kicked me out. Okay, they said get out of here, and I went to public school. But uh, yes. it was it was better than Catholic school. I didn't like it. But I was with nuns at that time. So. Yeah, I had nuns. Yeah, I had nuns. I was with nuns, and they had a ruler, and they were out there hitching. I thought I was gonna be a nun up really? until second grade. I was like, oh, maybe this is my life. <laughs> you would have probably put like a supreme outfit. Uh, yeah, like, you know, you know a, a nice nun little outfit. supreme habit. Yeah, yeah, that would have been classic. So you, so you're in New York, right? You know, well, there's there's so many things, but you're in New York. You're settling in New York, you know. When did you get, like, your first start at something? I know you worked at a tattoo shop, but then you also started directing music videos uh, with Kid Cudi at a young age, right? Mm -hmm. um, so many things. But when did you get your first start where, like, you felt you belong, like, you belong here, that you could stay here, that you could live here and do things? I think just moving here. Because I think once I moved here and settled, I felt connected. So I moved here and I went to art school and immediately I just felt like I, you know, it's just a place for me. I'm very independent. I don't have a driver's license, but I also like the sense of community, like, you know, and this is the beauty of New York. If for those of you who don't live here, but you know, sometimes people think, oh, New Yorkers are rude, but it's my thing is that New Yorkers have somewhere to go. Like we are always busy. Everyone, a single mom, a businessman on Wall Street, like everyone has somewhere to go, something to do. So you're constantly busy. So maybe that gives you the air that people aren't friendly, but it's completely untrue because- so many times, like people are look like need to get somewhere and can't speak English, and you'll see like a group of New Yorkers trying to figure out where this person needs to go. So that immediately speaks to me because I feel like you know this is just a place that I can identify with. But I moved here to answer your question. I moved here for art school, and loved it and then at the same time I was working at a tattoo shop I was working interning for film companies major film companies so I was sort of like in and out many doors and then when I graduated school I had my reel of work that I had done while I was in school and I was pitching it around and basically found a woman who was working at a record label who was in charge of music videos and showed her my reel and she you know gave me some pointers and was like okay this is what you need to change this is what you need to add but then a few months later she reached out and was like okay my husband's actually starting a production company and he's looking for new directors to be a part of this label and so I was one of them that he really liked so that was sort of like my first reel I would say and who did you who who did you do did the, what video did you start? It was with? a couple of artists that were, that maybe aren't so known as, you know, considering my roster, I guess, but um, a guy named Tony Hustle, mm -hmm. a guy named Beans. Um, but I also did, no, I don't remember what else I did, sorry. <laughs> but then you did, and then later on you did Kid Cudi, right? Yeah, so that, so later on I ended up getting a job through Nike ID because... Yeah. 255, Elizabeth? 255, yeah. So on 255 Elizabeth Street. So Nike had opened up a concept store that was basically for influencers, not really influencers, that didn't really exist then. It was for celebrities, uh, athletes, VIPs, um, probably people within the sneaker world, which it was, and they were invited to a private store <clears throat> that was not open to the public and you had to have an appointment and like a specific card and you know someone had to have invited you but um, so I worked there for about a year and a half and at that time I just become friends with like all the other local artists I do have something better to do no no no, 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 no. keep on going keep on going <laughs> no, no. okay um so I'd become friends with all the other local kids who were in New York trying to like do whatever they were doing. So Cuddy was one of them. Cuddy worked at the Bape store. Um, who else? Theophilus London. Um, a few other people. But so we became friends and just decided to collaborate. So Yeah. Now, who, who's some of the other roster that you did? On what roster? Your roster. Oh. Um, of, of directing videos. Uh, uh, Kid Cudi. You know, you know, one thing I got to tell you. You're not the best uh, uh, um, um, boaster. 
You know, you you should start to do that a little bit more. <laughs> it feels so weird. I know. Well, you've done it, but. Kid Cudi, what did you do? What video? I did Heaven at Night, which okay. was unfinished, but somehow it got leaked, and I still completely dislike the unedited version that got leaked, but um, it came out. Um, there's um, appearances by Fat Jew in there, because uh, we were all just sort of like a gang of like downtown kids hanging out, um, and Kendrick Lamar, uh, Theophilus London, Justin Bieber. Now, Justin Bieber was... Uh you did that. That was when they were playing the video games, right? Yeah. What, what song was that? Baby. It was um, t- uh, one time. Well, one time. Yeah, yeah. How the hell? Explain to the internet. How, how did that happen? So that came through Def Jam. I had left Def Jam, and then they reached out and they were interested in having me write for Justin Bieber. And so for me, I was like, oh, this the video would be cool because he's so young. If it was like a movie like from the '80s, where you know you have this big house, whoever lives there is not there, and you just decide to throw this like ill party and it's all kinds of kids. There's like the emo kids, the goth kids, the cheerleaders. Um, so that was sort of the concept that I wrote and then they chose it. Mm. And, and and so something like that came to you. Now they wanted you to write, you're saying they wanted you to write like uh, write for him, meaning just a director, like a video, or they wanted to write like songs? No, no, no. So oh, um, you said they wanted right. me to write yeah, for him. Yeah, so, so. Usually, yeah, most likely when you're being, if you are a director or a potential director, director and you want to um, direct a video for an artist, usually the label reaches out to these specific people and say, hey, this is our budget. It, this is the artist. Um, this is the song. You know, write something that you think that would work for this video. So I pitched my idea, I wrote my treatment, and pitched it, and so that was chosen. There you go. Yeah. She's now she's using uh, all the uh, <laughs> correct uh, terminology on me. Now, w- w- would you say that was a big song? Yeah. That was a big video. Yeah. I'm sure it has tremendous. Now, how do you get paid off of something like that? You just get like a flat fee? Yeah. So you don't get any residuals no. on the video or anything like that? No. No. Okay. Unfortunately not. Damn, that sucks because that video probably has like uh, at least a billion views, right? Yeah. You think so? Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out, but it's at least a billion. But yeah. It's, but it's probably in Scooter and uh, Justin and uh, oh, the yeah, label's yeah. money. <laughs> Um, so now that, having that had to be a tremendous resume builder, no? Yeah, for sure. Because in the beginning, no one knew who he was. I mean, not no one. I would say he had his own fan base, but people in the world that I was in didn't know who he was. And then shortly after, he exploded. Mm. Did you see him again? I've only seen him once, but that was years and years ago. So uh, I don't ever see him. No. You know, it's funny. Uh, a lot of people, again, like it's not only you, I just feel like people who have been able to basically do what they love, you know, um, and, and, and I feel like you're, you're one of them, meaning like do what you love and whether that be DJing or, or, or working with a brand or, you know, a lot of people, and I said this early on, but a lot of people don't know what people do when they do that. They ask, I get I get asked this all the time, you know, they can't confuse with your podcast, how you travel, how you're doing this, how you're doing that. What do you exactly do, right? Do people ask you that still? I know you said mom was asking what you do, but do people I mean, ask you what you do? No, I think nowadays people, however people have like figured you out or like however people have discovered you, they just decide that that's what you do. So like a lot of people who follow me now, they think, oh, you're just a DJ. DJ, yeah. They yeah. don't know that. Like, do you like I've, that? I think it's, I'm okay with it. Like I don't feel any type of way like you should know and have some put some respect in my name like I don't feel like that I just feel like okay cool it's cool that you know who I am like um I think it's it's just a different the, the world that we live in is different so yeah yeah I used to I used to feel that certain way back when I you know people used to be like oh you're premium P that sneaker guy and I was like that's it and I'm known as just a sneaker guy and then I remember going so hard to hustle in so many buckets to you know because I just didn't want it but then you're right you can't control what people take you in as yeah. you know like some like some people just like oh you're a podcaster right yeah. you know shoo shoo yeah you know? or somebody say oh you're a DJ you know like, you know but for me I, I remember like it was a it was something I was like you know I don't know. I was like, I don't want to just be known as a sneaker guy. And now speaking of sneakers, um, you know, now for you, I'm going to bounce all over. Usually, I try to go accordingly, but we will bounce all over. Okay. Um, you know, 
it's funny because most people probably don't even know this. You know, not a lot of the people in, involved in the sneaker culture and people who know, know, okay? But most people wouldn't even, like, if you think about it, I'm sure you could trump people a lot where you're like, oh, I'm the first girl or first uh, whoever designed. Do we still use that word? What? Trump? Trump? Uh, well, no, nah, not, not, not really. <laughs> But meaning like you could stunt. How about that? Yeah, could, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you could stunt on the, well, yeah, I mean, listen, you're doing a double entendre over here. Um, it, it, you, you could stunt on them in the sense of like, kind of like being the first, you know, girl, first woman who ever designed a Jordan, you know? And, and I'm sure that's got to be something that a lot of people don't know. A lot of people know, heads know, but I'm sure a lot of people like from the mass is like, that's got to be another resume builder, yeah. you know? Uh, that people don't know. You know, explain to the internet how that happened. Um, that happened in the most. You are the most popular man, by the way. No, I'm not. Don't take it. Yo, mean, let me tell you something, man. Most guys just let it slide, and and, and, and nobody ever knows what's going on. You, you, you're spilling all the beans. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, it's all good. It's the studio is hitting okay, me. Okay, gotcha. Somebody else hit me. It's all right. Um, no, the way that my Jordan came about was really quite natural um in 2009 i had a birthday party and for my birthday party i like to go all out because i just don't like my birthday i mean i'm not opposed to it now i'm just totally fine but i think at the time i was going through this phase of like i hate my birthday like how can i avoid the like thought of my birthday let me just throw a birthday party to sort of numb it um so i threw a big birthday party in 2009 cuddy was there um a lot of other friends i think q-tip was there um and for my birthday cake, I really wanted a Jordan 3 as my birthday cake because my Jordan, Jordan 3s are my favorite sneaker. Mm -hmm. um, and, Classic. Uh, yeah, and I decided, okay, I want a giant version, a giant cake version of my Jordan 3s. So had the cake made and they unveiled it. It was huge. I remember that cake. Yeah. I remember seeing it on the internet. And so I had no idea. My management had organized the setup and creation of it. So I didn't know what it was going to look like. I just said, this is what I want. I didn't know what it was going to look like. So they pull it out and I'm like losing my mind. I refused to let anyone cut into it. I was like, no, I'm going to save it. And then I got home and realized it does not fit in my refrigerator. It won't fit in any container in my home it's so big so I you have just to, threw it out no i had to cut into it and like force feed everyone cake you, everyone's you like no everybody over for cake. yeah it was just it was a hot mess but um so i mean like the next day hype beast uh all the yeah, sneaker yeah, blogs yeah, 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 covered yeah. it and was like oh my god vashi sneaker cake are so you was, trying to say you're the og sneaker cake yes uh, uh, i won't say that i'm the first but I you will know, say it, it's had its run, the sneaker cake. It has, but yeah. I will say that I, unt at that point, I, there was no way that that was like a huge thing. It wasn't. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And no, then my birthday was in April of 2009. In May of 2009, I was invited to a specific rapper's birthday party that was a private function. Who's specific? A last name West. I don't know. It's up okay. to you how you Kanye. decide. So he okay, had political a birthday party and all of a sudden they pull out a cake Yeezy and I was like, oh, I took a picture of it and I even put it on my blog but I was like, you were inspired by me but I mean at the time I was a little petty but I was, yeah, I was like, okay, I just had this done but okay, cool. Um, so I won't say that I, I will say that it was like the first that I have ever, ever saw a cake. So yeah, no, 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 listen. So so how did that lead up to? Now I remember obviously the legendary. I could even push forward. I remember the legendary Aster Chambers. Was yes, it? Aster Chambers. Shout out to Aster. He's had a shout Adidas out to now, him. Huh? Right? He's had yeah. He, I mean he the, he is the man. He's amazing. Um, did you know of him before though? He just yeah. Came no, I I met him a couple of times. Hung out with him a couple of times, like in a work setting, and um, I'd run into him in Soho and. It was a couple months after my birthday party, and we were chit chatting. And at that time, I thought he was at Nike, so we were just catching up. You know, he has a beautiful family. We're talking about his family, and then you know, I told him about my birthday party, and I was like, "Oh yeah, did you see my cake? It was a Jordan cake." And then he's like, "Do you know I'm at Brand Jordan now?" And I'm like, "No." And he's like, "Yeah." He's like, "You should totally design a Jordan." And I was like, "Yeah, okay." So I left that like, okay, you know, he's being nice because people talk shit, yeah, you, yeah, especially in any major city or just any city sure people are like yeah let's have lunch we'll we'll, we'll work we'll do something and then nothing let's ever happened build. exactly <laughs> and so the next day he literally was like hey we're gonna talk today we're gonna have the people of portland come like 
come on the phone too. We're going to chit chat about this Jordan too. So that's how it happened. And so they gave you free range because obviously the Jordan we're talking about uh, is the Jordan 2. Wait, I wish they would have given you a 3 to be able to design. I wish too, but at the time he's like, it's the anniversary of the of the 2 this year. He's like, you could wait. And I was like, no, I'm not waiting because I don't know if this opportunity yeah, that, is going to... Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Thank you for doing that. Because yeah, I was like, okay, I can't wait. So... um so they did they they did say that it was the 20th anniversary and for me wanting to be respectful of the 20 years I looked up what the 20th anniversary would be for anything. So you know like in marriage or business sure. or whatever there for every year there's a specific thing you would give someone to honor their celebration or anniversary. So like the first year might be wood, the second year is paper. For 20 years it was amber and it was I want to say silver. I forget. Sorry, but the elements are there. So there's amber on the on the uh, inner sole, and then there's silver in the laces. But for me, I wanted to also maintain my identity, which very much then and now was the color purple, because I have a clothing line called Violet. Probably, so the yeah. brand is you know based in the color purple, and for so many reasons. So the shoe was sort of like a dusty gray lavender, and I wanted it enough of a of a gray to sort of have a masculine appeal, so that guys would want to wear it because it was a technically it was a girl's Jordan and um, you know growing up as a girl who wears sneakers you have so many moments where you're like damn if only they could just make it like two sizes smaller like any hot shoe it's just like a lot of times they never made anything small enough for you to wear so and if they did they would you know, shrink it and pink it, and you're like, damn, I just don't want to girls are about you, I'm tired of pink sneakers yeah, it's like right, stop it but um so yeah, so that's how it happened. And for one year, I had to keep it under wraps. I couldn't talk about it. And, yeah. and I almost didn't even believe it was going to happen because I was like... Yeah, which is possible. Yeah, you know? they could have scrapped it. So yeah. they told you that it was going to come out in a year or did you know when it was going to come out? I didn't know. I just knew that it was it was set for 2010. I just didn't know if it was gonna, when it was going to be. And I never... I also was like, I'm not going to bother them about it. I'm just going to like see what they say. And then I remember, I think I was home and then all of a sudden I like started getting all these... Twitter like notifications of like what well, blogs picked it up yeah so the Jordan 2 Vashti yeah so it's crazy right yeah is, is this still uh, something that surprises you it, yeah definitely you know I speak to a lot of I've had a lot of people sit down uh, that design uh, sneakers especially Stash which is recently okay, yeah. which is very rare he doesn't sit down um, Nike did, did, did well Nike does it and a couple other people but did Jordan brand like give you like money for that or that was just like a promo it was not like a uh, like a paid situation like there was some funds but it wasn't like a thing did they do like an activation at that time like where you could go to stores or uh, no at that point I don't think that they knew I, not to say that they didn't know I'm I'm assuming that maybe they didn't foresee what that meant for the culture and what they meant sure. for other young women or women in general. Um, but even sneaker lovers or tons of men who are like, can you please sure. get this made in my size? So I think that that was sort of the beginning of, you know, the eye opening of like, you guys aren't, you guys are doing a, like a good amount for the culture, but you're not doing as much as you could, you sure. know, like there's definitely so many other worlds that you could be speaking to. We still got fresh pads on, uh, on deck. A couple, yeah. How many pairs did they give you when they did? Not that many because short, what? Yes. How dare them? They should have short, gave you at least 50. I know, but shortly after they were produced, I don't know. I mean, a lot of them, a lot of stores had sold out and they had run out of production. So they yeah. couldn't continue making it. You know, I actually, listen, th- th- that Jordan uh, um, is special for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, I believe, is because you did it. The second one is the colorway. I uh, think it's dope. You know, I I actually bought those for my daughter many years ago. Oh, they wow. even showed up in the outlet. Could you believe that? Wow. Yeah. And no disrespect. No, it. it's fine. But it I'm like, I'm all about a bargain. So. But, but, but here's the thing. Something like that shows up now when people go out and buy it like crazy. Yeah. It's not like a regular outlet shoe. Right. That's like almost like a hiccup. You know what I mean? But I remember seeing that. You know, have you had people come up to you and sign a sneaker? Like, I had, a, I think it was a boyfriend who got them for his girlfriend and was like, can you please sign the sneaker? And, so, and I was like, I really don't want to sign the sneaker. I will sign the box. Uh, so I signed the box for him, but it was a Christmas Why did you present. want to sign the sneaker? Because I just felt like, you know, I don't know how this is going to fade and that, that could look messy. Like, I have these vintage New York Knicks shorts, because a long time ago, the logo, used, it looked like the New York Yankees logo. Yep, yep, yep. So I have the a ball. pair, yeah, yeah, I have a pair of, like, 
their like official Nick shorts. And I keep thinking I want Clyde to like sign mine, but I'm like, I don't know if I want him to sign it in a way where people can see it. Cause it could, I don't know how it's going to fade. So yeah, but so. still it's quite, if he's not here, you're like, damn, I should have. No, I mean, he's going to sign it regardless, but it just might not be the front. Being yeah. a Knicks fan is not easy, man. I'll tell no. you, you know, I'm, I'm well, <laughs> I don't know. She went for, came from Sorry, Albany yeah. and adapted adapted to the Knicks, and she she's been dealing with Turner. I mean, we all been uh, yeah. Kings and Knicks fan. I'm a Knicks fan. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. we're, we're all know. Knicks fans. You know, it's the best city in the world. So, well, we're not doing nothing though. Well, it's fine. Everyone wants to come here. Well, we got the Yankees though. <laughs> you know, listen, I, I I'm so proud to see you uh, out here living your life. Okay. Um, you know, traveling the world. I asked you before about passports, and you're like, you know, I only have one. But then I was like, no, no, I mean, how many stamps you have on oh, the passport? Yeah. You know, traveling the world, Switzerland, right? We're, uh, Paris. I mean, I feel like you're always traveling. Even, uh, um, you know, I, and I never seen this, honestly, even displaying somebody that you're with loving. <laughs> I know the ginger god. I don't know his name, but I'm like, yo, it, it was a happy. Honestly, I mean this from a distance. It was I was happy to see you happy. Thank and you. And you can't tell me that you're not fuzzy. You took a picture it was drinking wine in a bath. I seen right. Oh yeah, yeah. I was like, cause I drink wine, so I appreciated that. Okay. The bath, I didn't really care for it. You okay. Know? You know, I need, but but what I'm saying is, I'm happy to see you happy. <laughs> is it? Are you happy? I am very happy. I'm very happy. Yes, thank you. And you're mostly a private person. Yeah. What makes you share it this time around? Um, I don't know. I think that um, it, life is weird. Like, social media is weird. Um, I think I like to share glimpses of my very personal life. But um, I don't know. I think that because we now live in a world where everything is so accessible and so seemingly connected, it's important to, like, keep certain moments private but you know then I realized I'm like oh like you know part of my journey is you know my relationship and you know being where I'm at so you know sh I like to also share with the people that follow me but just enough but um you know I went through something that was very public and then I went through some a lot of things that were well one thing that was really mostly private so then I just felt like maybe there's a balance. Trying to figure out the balance is key. Well, I got to give this kid credit. And the reason why for is for people listening who know of you again, will learn more. For people who don't know of you, uh, they welcome you have learned and you will learn more. Um, I got to give this credit cre credit because I've seen, you know, for those who don't know, you know, um, I've seen you put a picture up of you and Pharrell and said I ran into an old friend. <laughs> no, no, hold on, hold on. And you're dating this ginger god. What's his name? So I can just call him his name. Can I get his name? <laughs> ginger god works. Okay. And... <laughs> What the and 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 yo respect because a New York dude would probably be like yo, fuck you putting up this picture of this dude because you know dating him many many years ago, uh, but that I find that dope like you know what I mean you like oh, you live your life oh, this is my past you know that was so long ago no no, no the picture though no 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 I know but, but I'm think like, about what I'm saying right right, you right. Know? but then it's also it's like how evolved are we you know what I mean it's like it's the thing is is that I like to think that I'm evolved and that. Because of that, I've attracted someone else who's as evolved as I am. You know, obviously, I'm always going to be respectful. And I obviously ask the question, like, oh, is this, you know, and so he, he was there. And this other old friend's partner was also there. So it wasn't like a weird, awkward, like, hey, it was just like, oh, my God, this is so funny, isn't it? And it was just like, it was a cute moment. And it definitely, there was no, like side conversation it was just like wow it's so cool and like you know how's your family how's your you know sure, it was sure, like totally sure. love so it wasn't awkward or weird sure. or shout out to the ginger god for uh having thick skin you know <laughs> uh now listen uh as we wind this episode down you are where were you when you heard drake shout you out on the song I... and did you see that coming or that you know that was coming um, because listen, I fucking know Drake. I hate Sha Mia. And I used to get him all the kicks. I'm going to kick myself later because someone who worked on the album was like, and I'm blanking right now. Someone who worked on the album was like, you know, you got a shout out on uh, Drake's album that's coming out. And oh, so he heard it before. And yeah, so he was working on the album and heard it and was like, just so you know. And I was like, okay, God, I'm like mortified. What's it going to be? Like, my name rhymes with so many weird things. I was like, I don't know. So you're I mean, not thinking? Not, yeah, not that there was, because there's no stories, but I just was like, okay, if you're trying to rhyme something weird, like 
ashy and vashti. I don't know. I was like, I'm ashy, so I don't know. Um, you already got a lotion you know, after that. <laughs> so I was like, okay, what could it be? Uh, and then I was literally sitting on my couch when the album came out and was like, okay, listening to every song. Like, okay, it's not that. Okay, it's not. And then it came out. And I was like, oh, that's so cute. It was so funny. I mean, funny, not like. Haha. But it was like, wow, that's so cool that he actually put that in there because I feel like it just speaks to the culture more than it speaks to me, which it's nice that he shouted me out, but he could have shouted out like Q-Tip or whoever else. But I think that it was a nice shout out. Really nice. And also, again, speaks to the culture that he came from. Like he didn't just come out of thin air. He actually was at these like important like movements that were going on. So I thought it was really cool. Sure. And if you think about it, too, I mean, he was there. But you think about it like this is it could have been what he did was he commemorated the culture that he, you know, he wasn't there every, 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 every week, you know, like a head mm-hmm. that goes to your 19, 1992 parties right. that you created with uh, Oscar. Oscar, Shasta Oscar. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, you think about it, like, he, it meant something to him, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Where he could put it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, that's a big song, too. What was that? Walk Like I Talking? Yeah. With the Migos? Yeah. It's a big song. Yeah. But, yo, another resume builder yeah think about it how many fucking resume builders you have right <laughs> yeah well also Vic Mensage mentioned this me in a song it, recently really and that was, I, I just seen I, it I can't even I repeat it <laughs> I can't even repeat it but <laughs> oh he said something nasty about you it's not nasty but it was definitely in a a boyfriend wouldn't like that song You who, who's uh, somebody's boyfriend or yours no I'm just saying uh, yeah it's just uh, Oh, okay. It's, uh, it's a I sexual. I gotta go back. Antoinette's. Yeah. Go listen to that. Ginger. No, don't God. get Ginger upset. He'll turn red. You understand? <laughs> don't get Ginger upset. Because he likes wine. I fuck with the kid. You gotta ask him if he eat Trini food. Oh, uh, he's that he shrimp curry? He eats my dad's and my uncle's hot sauce every day. Really? Pepper sauce? Pepper sauce, yep. If he turns so. red, you won't know. No, 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 he doesn't. He handles it. Curry mango. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you bring Bus up shop. What's that called? Bus up shop. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I'm currently learning how to make all of it, so nice. next time I'll come and Yeah, didn't Q tip teach you how to DJ? He didn't teach me, but he kept urging me to. Okay. So who, who, what did you? What, I mean, I actually learned from Huggy Bear. Shout out to oh, shout Huggy, Huggy Bear. Bear. He started. He taught himself how to DJ, and then he taught me using a controller. So, and then he ultimately helped me find turntables, which I own now. And then I went into turntables, which um, DJ Nominon, who was at Scratch Academy, he officially taught me, and he is from. Albany or the Albany area so I kind of knew of him he was like the god DJ in Albany but um so I learned from him officially on turntables do you do you, do you try to uh, I know you play a lot of different shit and what I mean by that is like you'll play everything from 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 a two chains record to a Travis Scott record to uh I think maybe Tom, like Petty. Bon, Tom Petty or <laughs> I think maybe Bon Jovi I may have heard you play before maybe yeah um but do you cater that to the party you go into? Like, say if they're like, hey, we want you to do something for uh, Versace or or they want to do something for uh, uh, Maybelline. Like, do you cater it to where you are or you just play your own set? No, never. I always play for the crowd and who they are. Um, I'll listen to what the client wants, but ultimately I pay attention to what the crowd's going to move to. Um, recently I did a job in Bali for IBM and... Uh, it was for Bali, yeah, I mean, in Bali, okay. yeah, and it was Shit. for a thousand people from twenty-two different countries around the world. And they specifically, IBM is an incredible client. They said, please play music from each of these countries. So it was music from China, from Japan, Korea, India, um, Croatia, and I made sure to figure out like what what worked together. Like made sure it had to like flow and feel good and so that was like that was a really fun experience because I never get jobs like that like where it's so many different kinds of people in one room but it's it's all about paying attention to the crowd um, I did I DJed a Tommy Hilfiger fashion week event last year and the crowd I mean you have like the board and the company and they're like older white men who you know the the heritage of Tommy Hilfiger is music. It's definitely hip hop, sure, sure. but Tommy, That's a grand poob. yeah, and Tommy and his brother, they love rock. They love like Blondie and you know like you know Peter Gabriel. So I was like mixing it up, and they were like, "Yes, thank you." It was like you know Nicki Minaj, and then it was old rock. So it's I I like to blend different genres. Listen, for a girl from Albany, man, you traveled the world. You were able to design your own fucking Jordan too. Uh, Drake is shouting you out, uh, possibly one of the biggest artists of our generation. Um, 
I mean, we keep on going. Uh, 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 where was it? There's so. I mean, you directed for Justin Bieber. I mean, there's so many, so much more than that. But from a girl from Albany, have you ever came across somebody that you were uh, kind of like nervous to meet or couldn't believe? Because you're in a lot of rooms. You know, when we move around, you're in a lot of rooms. Who knows? You could be in Bali. Next, thing you know, you could have met if Prince. If Prince was still alive, you, you, I DJed you, for Prince. What? Yeah. I did. It was a private event. How the fuck did that happen? Um, he, his team reached out and wanted me to direct a video for him. I was in London at the time. And they were like, oh, if you're still in London, he'd like to meet you. And I was like, oh, I'm actually going back to New York. They were like, he really wants to do a video with you or have you direct something for him. And I was like, okay. Timing didn't work out. And then they were like, can you just come to Minneapolis? And can you DJ for him and his friends? It was a small group of people. And I was like, of course I can. But I'm bringing a friend in case I look him in the eye. And the next thing you know, I'm like living in Minneapolis, like bathing myself in the water of Lake yeah, Minnetonka. I was, yeah, I was like, OK, I need to bring a friend. I brought a friend and DJed for him. And wow. he popped up and he was as magnificent as you could imagine but even beyond because I DJed and it was for a group of like a couple of his friends that musicians that were younger but then he had people that were from Essence because I think he was doing Essence Essence Fence Essence Fest that year and a couple of other people who were into like politics and we were in his studio and he's like so how can we get young people involved how can he was so about the people like that whole night was just about empowering young people and the future and it was just amazing it wasn't weird it wasn't you know inappropriate it was just it was completely beautiful and like so mm. Amazing. Yeah. So 1992 party still going on. Where's it going on for people who live here or people who want to come, you know, out of town when you they're know, in town? You it's it bounces around. Skamansky is definitely a home here and there for 1992. But we're, we're exploring the city. You know, the city is ever evolving and changing. So, you know, we're trying to figure out, like, the next home. But it could be Skamansky. It could be S&S Bar. We're trying to figure that out. S&S Bar is dope. Shouts to Peter and Eric. And DJ Soul. For, yeah, DJ Soul. Yeah. yeah, he's manning things down there. Um, what's what's next for Vashti? What's next? For, I mean, you're still DJing around the world. Yeah, uh, so I'm DJing definitely around the world. I am... You should write a book. Huh? You should write a book. I should? Yeah. <laughs> Joanna's over here like, yeah, let's do it. Um, so I'm doing a wellness series on YouTube. Okay. So check that out. No, no, actually, that's that's where you, you, I tried your thing about, what is it, when you wake up, you drink uh, hot water or something like that? What, like room uh, temperature what? water or hot water, yeah. Yeah. and But the other thing I'm scared to try. Celery juice? No, no. This, this, this thing you put in the tube. Oh, the you. colonic. Yes. You know. I'm scared to do this thing. Don't be scared. Because okay. I, I will be honest, like, I was scared. I'm, that's not an area where I'm like, what? You No. Okay. So for me, that became more about, like, wellness. Like, it's just, it's literally about our health. You know, think about all the things you've eaten in your lifetime and the things that build up. It's just, water can only do so much. If you think about your pipes in your home, like, does, you does it, your clean? health coverage cover that, or that's like cosmetic? No, that is, it's cosmetic. Well, not cosmetic, meaning like how right, cosmetic is. Right, but I, I would say for me... How much is it? It's $115. Okay. Um, but for me, the long-term effects are really beneficial. Yeah, and you're still, you, you, you've been vegan since, for how long? For mostly since I was 12, mostly. God damn. And I'm 18 now, so... Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, listen, uh, at Vashti, V-A-S-H-T-I-E, uh, right? Um, Twitter, you still fuck with Twitter? I'm on Twitter here and there. I okay. like to read more than I write, but yes. Okay, well, listen, Internet, uh, Vashti may be coming to a town near you, DJing all over the world. Check out for her parties. Check out wellness or YouTube what, uh, Vashti? Uh, uh, YouTube.com slash Vashti. Okay, listen. Wellness from a from a you know approachable perspective. Okay, I like it. There's too much to go over with you in one episode, but listen, I'm glad we finally were able to make this happen. I want, you know, you're an inspiring uh, person to me, uh, somebody who overcame a lot, um, you know, uh, made it out of Albany, uh, and and really were able to follow your dreams, man, and live in them. So I'm proud. Uh, blessings, uh, and uh, thanks for coming by. Thank you for having me. Internet's the one and only Vasty. Cheer. Internet, if you enjoyed that episode, then hit me up. That's right. Email me at thepremiumpeatshow at gmail.com. Again, that's thepremiumpeatshow at gmail.com. If you're an advertiser, any big company, small company, startup, whatever it is, you want to advertise on the Premium Peep Show, 
hit me up. Email the premium Pete show at gmail.com and we'll, we'll get to working. Okay. And if you have a suggestion or you want to hear a certain guest on the show, whatever it is. Okay. You know, you could at premium Pete at premium Pete show on Twitter, or Instagram, or for the last time I'll tell you, well, I'm not going to, it's not the last time. Email me the premium Pete show at gmail.com and let's get to working. Cheer.